Good evening, everyone. Dr. Alan Christensen here with you and really excited for our next webinar. I want to really thank you guys for being with me tonight. This is a big evening. I know there's a state of the union going on. And <laughs> so I really thank those of, those of you who chose to be here and we'll talk about something that'll be useful, I think. Uh, this is a super important topic, all about energy and uh, adrenal health. And yeah, I don't have food on my face. I wiped out cross-country skiing pretty badly the other day. <laughs> so yeah, I was bleeding. It was swollen, but it's pretty weird. I never really bruise. I've taken a lot of big falls, and but I, I just don't bruise or it never happens. So this would have been huge and black otherwise, but that's just some weird quirk. So there it is. But yeah, uh, with you in the big north woods tonight for another event. There's a frozen lake out there behind me, and it's warmed up quite a bit. It's close to freezing now, which is a pretty cool thing. But yeah, we'll cover adrenal health and fatigue issues. This is one of the most important symptoms. So I'm with you guys on a couple of formats. I'm with you on Instagram. I'm with you all on Facebook Live. And here in the studio audience, <laughs> we got the group on Zoom. Uh, if you want to come and join us in the studio audience, you can come on over. My, my dear assistant, Josh, I think is placing a link up here shortly. And you can come on over and join us there in the Zoom. I'll talk for about, I don't know, 30 minutes, 35, 40. And then we'll do some live Q&A. And we'll talk about fatigue. We'll talk about adrenal health. The live Q&A is really going to be active in the studio audience. So if you want to be part of that, come on over. I will stop the Instagram feed before we go to the Q&A because you won't hear things directly there otherwise, but you'll hear the whole presentation. So you're welcome to catch that. And yeah, if you want to come join us in the Q&A. So the Q&A on the studio audience for the Zoom, if you're here for the first time, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. You've got the option of raising your hand and that's under your participant controls. Some of you all have done that already. And when I finish the discussion, I'll grab some of those who have asked questions in order. And it's really fun if you can join me on video so we can just speak in real time. Uh, so yeah, I'll grab a few of those questions afterwards. We'll talk about those and we'll wrap things up. So this is sponsored by Thyroid Specific Formulations. And this is one of the last couple in this series of webinars about some of the top main thyroid concerns. So the backstory on that, I had a I had a pretty exceptional year when writing the manuscript for the thyroid reset diet. And I spent about a year just pouring through massive amounts of medical literature. I mean, no exaggeration, everything I could find on diet and thyroid function, uh, thyroid function and nutraceuticals, thyroid function and lifestyle, every single research paper I could find, I, I read and I compiled. And the goal was to write Hmm. Well, the goal was broader than I had going into it than I actually finished. The goal was to cover a lot of facets of thyroid disease, but I had far too much material to fit in the book. So the book became focused on the dietary side of it. And that's the story about iodine, uh, low iodine diets reversing the disease. And that, that's been just exceptional. I talked to several people today with my thyroid second opinion consults. And there's so many people that are seeing their disease reverse by following the diet. So it's been super rewarding. But I also found massive amounts of data about nutraceuticals having good evidence for some of the big concerns of thyroid disease, you know, lowering antibodies, shrinking the nodules, and boosting energy. And these, this data that I found really didn't fit in existing nutraceutical products. So I thought about, you know, writing it up, but there was really nothing to point people toward. So I realized this chunk of data had to be a new product line. So we made a brand new product line to cover these top concerns. And I wanted to educate you all, yeah, on the product and how to use them, sure, but also on what these concerns mean and what else can be caused and what else you can do. So I wanted to have some real detailed, informative discussions about these top concerns. And this one is really about fatigue and some ways you can help with that. So yeah, we've got a couple more coming up. I know we've got one on easy iron and I think one other one still. But, but yeah, this is winding down the series. And it's been a lot of fun doing these and connecting with you all. I was just telling someone, I think I will find some way that we can do live Zoom sessions for more general purposes. You know, maybe a, maybe a subscription type thing, maybe a regular basis and themes or topics. So 
I'm kind of playing with that, but I want to keep on doing this because he's been a lot of fun to connect with you guys. So I did see Josh put those link in there. Uh, oh, next one is the last one. Oh, thank you, Josh. Yeah, I couldn't think of what the topics would have been. So that one's going to be about uh, iron, if I remember correctly. And that's a big topic also and a good tie-in with, with fatigue. So let's get going on this one. And I'm going to share some slides with you all. These are visible on the, uh, in the Zoom group and on the uh, Facebook group. They're not visible on the Instagram, but I'll talk about the main content there. And again, if you want to come on over, you sure can. You can join us anytime in the studio audience. So first up, I want to just talk about how it is that thyroid disease causes fatigue. And a point that I want to really bring home is that there's a lot of different problems that can give rise to fatigue, but they do so by a rather short list of mechanisms. So a lot of things cause fatigue for a short number of ways, <laughs> if that makes sense. I'll hit that at a few different angles. But we know that thyroid disease is associated with a worsening of energy levels. And I just actually finished a manuscript this morning. <laughs> the next book, I just finished it this morning. And in it, I wrote quite a bit about fatigue as well. So I've got some numbers top of mind. Yeah, the average American feels that about 3.4 days per week, their energy levels are insufficient. So this is rampant. This is a really huge problem. And this is among the top medical complaints of all. So when someone goes to see a doctor, one of the biggest reasons they do is because they're too tired. And how do you differentiate fatigue from just like tiredness you know, or being run down? Well, the difference is that it's not expected. So you're tired when you expect to be tired. So when I, when I wiped out uh, Lake Itasca State Park, it's not too far from where I am. That's the headwaters of the Mississippi River. So this massive mile wide river, there's a spot where it comes out of Lake Itasca and it's probably six inches deep and maybe like 20, 30 feet wide. Yeah, six, 12 inches deep. And you can wade right across it. It's so beautiful there. And the whole park, there's about 30 miles of roads and trails. And in the wintertime, they don't plow them, but they groom them. So there's no cars, but it's all open for cross-country skiing. So I was all over Lake Itasca and I got turned around. I was out longer than I planned on being. I had some, I had some food with and I had some water, but in one of my tumbles, I lost my water bottle out of the back of my jersey. So I really didn't have that. And I ended up being out for about three hours and covered a lot of miles and was, was tired. I was pretty tired. And for I'm, I'm mostly bounced back, but I was pretty wiped out for the day afterward. So that wouldn't be called fatigue because that was expected. So when you do something that's unusual and you're, you're run down afterward, well, you expect that. Or if you didn't sleep enough, you know, you expect that. But fatigue is when it doesn't fit. You know, fatigue is when you feel like you're wiped out, but there's no good reason to be wiped out. There's some fancier medical lingo that's used around that, but that's pretty much what it comes down to. So fatigue is defined by unexplained and persistent tiredness that doesn't respond to rest. That's the other big difference. When it's normal tiredness, you know, you take it easy for a while and you're going to feel better again. But fatigue doesn't do that. You know, you feel like you did something more than you did and resting doesn't make it better again. And it's something that it affects the body just across the board. So muscular fatigue correlates with mental fatigue and it correlates with just a lower mood, uh, less enthusiasm, you know, less of a drive, uh, more eagerness to withdraw. You know, socializing takes a fair amount of brain power. And if someone is low in energy, they tend not to do that. So there's a lot of negative spirals that set up because people, they don't want to do physical things that could be healthy. They don't want to socialize. They don't want to do self-care. They're less apt to want to cook. And a whole lot of negative spirals ensue from that. So what are the hows and what are the connections with thyroid disease? Well, we know that there's a lot of cortisol disruption. Cortisol, that's going to be one of our big themes today. It's a hormone that fluctuates throughout the day. So we call that a circadian hormone. And its fluctuations are deliberate. When it rises and falls, that allows your cells to properly take in hormone or block hormone. But when cortisol is not working right, then hormone cannot be brought into the cells. So thyroid disease can cause that to become disrupted. We also know that we can see just a higher amount of generalized inflammation. Thyroid hormones, especially T2, 
have a lot of rules to play with how ATP is formed. And ATP is like gas to your body's engine. You know, it's one of the main metabolic fuels that we use. Uh, and as part of that, we will see disordered mitochondrial function. And glycogen cannot be stored properly. Glycogen is the main fuel substrate that you burn to generate ATP. And finally, then the circadian rhythm itself can become altered. But these are some of all the ways that these things tie into thyroid disease. So what else goes along with fatigue? Well, I mentioned a few of those, but we'll see muscle aches. There's been a lot of data saying that fatigue itself, it's something that can be a nuisance, but it's also a risk. The more people have fatigue, the more likely they are to have just early death and severe chronic disease. And I thought of this now because the subtype of fatigue that most strongly predicts early death is actually muscular fatigue and muscular fatigue that limits physical activity. So that's a big deal and it's a huge risk and it takes away from quality of life. Uh, depression. So tired muscles lead to a tired brain and a lower mood and a difficulty making healthy endorphins. Generalized weakness, oftentimes dizziness, and then brain fog. So things that would take mental effort, you know, one doesn't have the capacity to work as hard mentally and things become more difficult. Uh, word recall, uh, name recognition, uh, task management, those things become much harder to address. So I'm seeing a lot of folks jumping on right now. So just, yeah, welcome. Um, <laughs> uh, talking here about fatigue this evening and about some solutions for that I'm with you all on Instagram, Facebook, and Zoom. And if you wish to come be part of the studio audience, come on over to the Zoom. This is the studio audience area, and we'll do some live Q&A at the end of, the, end of it. Facebook, I'll talk, I'm sorry, Instagram, I'll talk for about half an hour. We'll wrap it up. But yeah, you can come on over and do some live questions at the end. And I'm seeing a lot of hands up already, so we'll have plenty to talk about. Um, and then we think through these additional symptoms and how thyroid disease can be a big driver. But thyroid disease rarely exists by itself. So this is another big thing that I got from that year of met time in the medical literature. I call these the comorbidity. So more, mortality is death, morbidity is disease. So co is secondary. So if you've got one thing, there's often a thing that pairs with it. And we know that thyroid disease, that 84% of the time, people have multiple comorbidities. They have other things also affecting them. So one important point with that is, yes, you want to really dial in your thyroid function, but even if you do, many people still have symptoms. And that's because they've often not diagnosed and treated the comorbidities. So these are some of the ones that are important that I'll mention. Um, adrenal stress. We'll talk a lot about that this evening and its relevance. Apnea. So apnea, difficulty sleeping at night. And this is not just the, the big guy who's snoring loud. This can be any age, any gender, and any size. Low B12 levels. So about 30 to 40% of people who have thyroid disease also have autoimmune gastritis, and they cannot absorb certain nutrients well. Iron and B12 are two of the biggest ones. Caffeine toxicity. This is often a really surprising one for people, but this is a very big cause of known adult fatigue. Now, caffeine is something to where you can, many people can have you know, a few cups a day their whole lives and have no adverse effects from that. In fact, a lot of the sources of caffeine, especially tea, can be quite rich in polyphenols and flavonoids and may offer various protective health benefits. But <laughs> we can reach a point at where we cannot clear caffeine as well. And suddenly it might take us more than a full day to get rid of a dose. And if we have a dose every day and it takes more than a day to get rid of it, we develop a backlog. And so what caffeine does is it makes us pretend we're not tired when we're really tired. So here's the chemistry behind that. We talked briefly about ATP. That's adenosine triphosphate. And when the body uses that for energy, it breaks it to from triphosphate three to diphosphate one, two to monophosphate one, and then just adenosine. So when it's all burned up, the ash that's left is adenosine. And when there's adenosine floating around in your brain, your brain says, oh, wow, I'm tired. And two things happen. The adenosine 
fits into a receptor that's made for it. And that's good because your brain knows, hey, there's a lot of adenosine around. I've got to relax because I'm out of energy. But the other thing that happens from that is you absorb that adenosine and you make it back into ATP again. So that's cool. Well, caffeine gums up the adenosine receptor. So you don't feel tired, but you also don't regenerate your ATP. (laughs) So you should feel tired, but you don't. And guess what happens? Well, your body makes more receptors. So then you get more eight, more adenosine floating around. So if you use caffeine regularly, the amount of adenosine you have in circulation is higher than it ever would be. So you get this massive backlog of unrecycled ATP that you can't access. And occasional use, you know, no big deal. But regular use, a lot of people are chronically tired just because they can't rebuild their adenosine. So this is a very real phenomenon. You know, depression can be an effect. It can also be a cause of fatigue as well. When the mood is lower, the energy levels can drop correspondingly. Urinary tract infections. Boy, this is a big one. I've I've learned this from, from practicing for so many years that if a woman is tired and there's no clear reason for that and it's not normal for her, this is one thing to think about. And for sure, there are those that that obviously know of having a urinary tract infection. It burns and hurts when they pee. But in many cases, there are no symptoms whatsoever. A lot of people can have bad urinary infections and have zero bladder symptoms, but it's making them tired. So yeah, this is one to think about as well. A few others to consider. We mentioned B12. Iron can go along with that. We'll do a deep dive in that next week. So I won't talk too much about that today. Um, Overweight. This is one that's really big and often not thought of, but I mentioned a bit during the metabolism boost discussion, how weight by itself can explain a lot of symptoms. So if if someone's struggling with their weight and they don't know why they're tired or why they have chronic pain or why they have difficult digestion, it's always good to consider all the possible causes, but barring anything else obvious, weight can cause all of that and then some. So please know this by itself can be a big cause. And I've seen many people that they say, hey, I know my weight's an issue, but I can't figure out why I'm so tired. Like, well, let's see if there's any obvious reasons, but if there's not, that may be it. That can be the biggest single factor. It doesn't take some exotic, weird, you know, Lyme disease or mold. Like, no, if you're you're too heavy, that by itself, that's a more simple explanation and it can affect quite a bit. Thyroid antibodies, and we mentioned that a bit before in that topic, how when they're extremely high, they may contribute to fatigue symptoms, poor sleep. A lot of medications can do this. So beta blockers, uh, calcium channel blockers, other things that lower blood pressure or heart rate can often cause ongoing fatigue. Sleep aids, uh, Ambien, this is a big deal. Sleep aids, boy, if you really look at their performance and how well they work, you would you would fire them. You would, yeah, they don't give people a greater amount of quality sleep. They do give some people a few more minutes of shut-eye, but that few more minutes of shut-eye is at the cost of more minutes of REM and deep restorative sleep. So there's no net benefit to sleep quality or sleep architecture, but there's a really high rate of daytime fatigue and grogginess. Uh, allergy medications, Boy, so this is more so the oral ones, the oral antihistamines. Histamine is part of being alert. And when you block histamine, you're not alert. That's why Benadryl can put a lot of people to sleep. But yeah, allergy medications can be big ongoing causes of fatigue. And then we think about anxiety medications, uh, Xanax, Ativan, Valium. These are huge factors. These are things that are not made for long-term use. It's very clear in the package inserts and they cause severe fatigue. They're not different than it is to be drunk as far as how your brain goes. So yeah, these are big things. And I think all too often people are put on medication and really not given a clear sense of what this can do to them and how this can affect them. And then same thing, they can find symptoms show up and people think about what are the exotic causes of these symptoms? It may not be an exotic cause. It may just be these darn pills you've been taking for so long. But yeah, this is a big factor. Now, here's a couple of really important points that are going to set the stage for a lot of the rest of our discussion, and they're going to make a lot of these solutions make more sense. And I think they're really optimistic points, too. So 
we really are enamored with finding the cause, the root cause, the underlying cause, the base cause of things. And we should be, you know, we should seek that out when we can. The cause is not always found. There are many times where there's not a smoking gun or there are multiple causes or the cause cannot be reversed in the short term. So that happens as well, but that doesn't mean you're stuck. So there's a short number of ways that fatigue really causes breakdown in the body. And most of those come down to immune dysfunction, uh, elevation of inflammation, inhibition of oxygen utilization, or generation of free radicals. So it's usually one of those four different mechanisms. Even though there's hundreds of causes, that's the way they break things down. There's only a few ways that things break down. And so because of that, even if the cause is not found, not treatable, you know, can't be made sense out of, there are steps that can help those mechanisms. And we've seen from really good data that things that can help those mechanisms that improve fatigue from one cause usually can help fatigue from another cause. So most of our research on this comes from uh, people that are on ongoing treatment for cancer, uh, people that have cardiovascular disease later stage, and then those with thyroid disease. So those are some of the main populations with fatigue that have been looked at. And then also we have data from endurance athletes. So they get tired because they're pushing it hard and they want to be able to go further. So what makes them go further and what helps people not be tired when there's some reason to be tired? So all those things are different, but they all share those same mechanisms. They're all inflammation, immune dysregulation, poor oxygen utilization, free radical formation. There's something like that happening in all those cases. And so things that help those four mechanisms can make a good difference on fatigue, regardless of where it's coming from. Now, I'm not saying that one thing can treat all fatigue by any means. I'm not saying that you don't want to know the cause, quite the opposite. But while you're finding, while you're correcting the cause, if the cause is not known, you can address these core mechanisms and help fatigue from a big variety of causes. So that's, that's like the really cool take-home point here is that I talked before about all these different things that can go wrong. And, you know, there's no, there's no pat answer on to how you know which of those you have. That's really some time with a good diagnostic specialist. That's someone who's thinking through and when your fatigue came on, what are your abnormalities? They're screening you thoroughly, but they're also screening specifically and they answer those questions. That's not always easy. That's not always available, but we know the ways fatigue works in the body. So if we can manage those four big pathways, we can improve upon fatigue even without there being a simple, obvious switch to flip. So with that, now it'll make sense why we can talk about some of the solutions. And I'll talk a bit about some nutraceuticals that are well-documented to be helpful. I'll also talk a bit more about some of the ways in which we go about diagnosing adrenal function, some of the patterns that emerge, and how you address your adrenal health, to what extent you need diagnostic data, to what extent can you base things off of your, your key symptoms, and how do you make sense of all that? And then we'll grab some questions to make it more actionable for those of you all who are here. So that's what I got queued up. <laughs> okay, so first up, we'll talk through some of these nutraceuticals. Um, this is a fun one to talk about. This is cordyceps, uh, cordyceps sinensis. So this is actually pretty weird stuff. This is a fungi that grows in the cocoon of the silkworm moth. <laughs> so it's something that's been well studied as an ergogenic aid, meaning that it can improve performance. Now, remember, even if you're not trying to improve your performance, but you're more tired than you should be, things that improve performance can help in those cases as well. And we've got good data saying that cordyceps can increase glycogen, can lower inflammation, and benefit overall energy output. And I should say, too, these items I'll talk about, I was pretty fussy, and I'm only going to talk about things that have high-quality human evidence. So these are things that have been shown in controlled studies to help humans uh, have better energy if they had chronic disease, have better energy if they had undisclosed fatigue for no clear reason, or perform better in physical or mental tasks. So placebo studies, high-quality reproduced human studies, actual real-world outcomes. That's all I'll talk about. There's a million things that have been said to be helpful, but a lot of them 
we just don't know that they work or we don't have data to think that they work. But these are things we can really hang some confidence on. Another thing that I've thought through is there are things also that can adjust cortisol metabolism. They can make cortisol go higher or lower. And I have used those in our specific adrenal reset packs, but I wanted to give some options for people that didn't know where their cortisol needed to move. So everything I'll talk about now has an adaptogenic effect. It has a corrective effect. And what that means is it'll help your body come back to center wherever it's starting from. So you don't have to worry about the exact findings and the exact current situation. If you know enough that you don't feel well, that's enough to be safely effective. Uh, next up will be Panax ginseng. There's a lot of different ginsengs, and this is a specific subtype. Uh, this is also called Panax quincifolium. Now, this is one we've got more than 140 good quality studies and good information showing that this can improve fatigue from chronic illness. Uh, this is one that tends to show rather quick effects when used properly. So as few as 15 days, we can see fatigue scores improve pretty well. So our data on fatigue comes mostly from quality of life surveys. You know, we can't, there's no blood test for fatigue. There's no way to measure it with a ruler. But if someone's given detailed questionnaires, that can be rather objective as to where their energy is at a given point in time. So that's one data set. Again, the other one is athletes. And they're not the same category, but they're measurable. You know, you can measure performance pretty well. So that's how we objectively know what helps and to what degree that it helps. Another one that's useful is carnitine. So some good data on this. Now, this has been shown specifically to help improve mental fatigue from thyroid disease and specific studies that are useful post-thyroidectomy. Now, I've had some good questions before about carnitine because I did include it in hyperthyroid support, and some thought that it would then slow thyroid function. Well, in the case of hyperthyroidism, there was talk about it being used to slow thyroid function. It didn't pan out that way, but there is good data saying it can cut the risk of cardiovascular trauma from hyperthyroidism. So I included it in hyperthyroid support not because it slows the thyroid, but because it protects the body. And so in this case, it can also be a benefit for mitochondrial function. What it does is it helps triglycerides be shuttled into the mitochondria to be utilized for fuel. And yeah, specific studies on fatigue relative to thyroid disease with it. Next up to mention here is L-theanine. This is kind of a neat thing. It's a, it's a non- protein amino acid, and it's a non-essential amino acid. We find a bit of this in tea and in some types of mushrooms. Now, this is pretty cool because it, it's something that's been shown to, to both increase mental capacity while lowering the effects of anxiety. And that's kind of a tough combination. A lot of things that lower anxiety end up just being sedatives, like the benzodiazepines that I mentioned, but not so with theanine. It calms the mind and makes it more focused. One four-week study showed specifically that depressive symptoms, uh, changes in cognitive function, and verbal fluency, so word recall, word selection, could all improve from it, from the use of theanine. Another thing that's relevant is pantothenic acid, also known as vitamin B5. This is a critical part of ACTH response. I'm going to talk a bit more about ACTH a little later, but a lot of you know about TSH, so thyroid-stimulating hormone, the brain telling the thyroid to work. Well, ACTH is adrenal corticotropic hormone. This is the brain telling the adrenals to work, and this does depend upon a certain amount of pantothenate. And that's true for both cortisol and DHEA production. It's also a rate-limiting part of utilization of both carbohydrate and fat as an energy substrate. Uh, here's one that I love. This is astragalus. Uh, this is also called milk vetch. And this is one of the most gentle adaptogens that we know of. It's been used for thousands of years as an ingredient in soup. <laughs> you know, the, the actual root itself, it comes sliced, and it looks almost just like a tongue depressor. It's, it's not quite that perfectly shaped, but it's pretty close. And it's a really gentle flavor. It's a, it's a lovely thing to throw into soups. 
but good data on this benefiting fatigue after stroke. I mentioned those main four drivers of fatigue. One of those was hypoxia or poor oxygen utilization. So a stroke is an extreme example of that. That's where part of the brain has lost oxygen. And when that causes fatigue, the fatigue is really just intractable, really deeply set. But astragalus can benefit with fatigue even in those situations. Um, well, I'm go out of order here. Another one to mention that's relevant is rhodiola. So this one, we've got good data, rather recent papers about it having an adaptogenic effect upon salivary cortisol. And salivary cortisol is a real thing. It does predict uh, overall health risks and a lot of symptoms. And it's something that does correlate with the body's overall diurnal rhythm and the circadian cycle. We also know that rhodiola can benefit mental capacity. This is about six to eight weeks for a time for a time frame for its effects, and also increases in attention and alertness and focus. A couple more herbs to mention, uh, just a few more of them. One more is ashwagandha. So this is withania somnifera. There's a couple of really old animal studies suggesting that this boosts thyroid output. It's got good data saying that it can help with cortisol regulation, and there's no harm to thyroid function, but not a thyroid tonic per se, and it's nothing that's harmful for those who are on thyroid treatment. A uh, funny thing with the Sanskrit name ashwagandha, the literal translation of that is smells like a horse. <laughs> I don't think it smells unpleasant, but I can kind of see how someone could make that association. This is also a very safe thing that can be used in a broad range of dosages. You know, herbal compounds, some of them are like super precise. There's things like belladonna or aconite to where, you know, fractions of a drop can be used in very specific circumstances. They got a lot of safety concerns. And then there's other herbs that are practically as toxic as carrots, <laughs> meaning that anybody can have a lot and they're, they're quite safe. And ashwagandha and astragalus are really strong examples of that. They're, they're root-like food compounds. So no big drawbacks to them. Another really well-documented herb that's not talked about a lot is Eleutherococcus. This has also been called Siberian ginseng. And this is documented to regulate adrenal output, but also parasympathetic output. So the adrenals are part of this thing called the HPA axis hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that's the body's central stress buffering pathway. So when they've talked about things like adrenal fatigue, it's probably more accurate to talk about HPA function. You know, over chronic stress, the HPA gets trigger happy and it treats everything as a stressor. And the drawback about that is it can't go into reparative mode. You know, our body has this fight or flight response that we talk about but the opposite side is called tend and befriend or feed and breed or care and repair, you know? So sympathetic is fight or flight. And parasympathetic is where we rest and recover and heal ourselves. So Eleuthero is well-documented to make us more readily go into that parasympathetic mode. So double-blind placebo-controlled studies, good reversal of fatigue, and specifically fatigue in cases of thyroid disease. So last one to talk about, this is L-citrulline. Not one you hear about quite as much, but really good data about it benefiting exercise capacity. This is true for both genders, pretty good evidence about increasing physical strength in females, and also at making the body's alpha-2 receptors more active. What that means is your muscles get hungrier for fat. <laughs> your, your muscles burn fat and burn glucose more effectively. And papers have shown that citrulline can do that to an even greater extent than high-intensity interval training can do. So I want to talk a bit about these solutions together and then also about the levels, the varying levels of adrenal function. I get a lot of questions about this. So with Celebrate Cortisol panels, there's different rhythms that show up. So the first one is what we call the stressed phase. So this red, there's a red line I'm showing on the screen, and the red line represents where someone's results were, and the blue and the green represent the high and the low of the normal range. So when someone's cortisol is consistently above range, we say that they're in the stressed phase. 
Uh, this is this is the typically the first stage of adrenal adaptation. And if things persist and they decompensate, they often move into this wired and tired stage. And here you can see their their total cortisol they're making is probably about right, but they're not making it at the right times. So we're often seeing a low morning and a high nighttime cortisol. And then we think about the crashed stage, the deepest set one. At this point, cortisol is underproduced just about the entire day. So how does this compare with the adrenal packs that are made for stress, for wired heart, for crashed? And what does one need to know about adrenal testing? Well, this is what we see from salivary cortisol levels. Then we have blood markers to think about. So with blood markers, there's the morning serum cortisol as one main thing to look at, and then ACTH. So I talked about briefly about TSH for the thyroid, but this is kind of like the TSH for the adrenals. And there are times where the adrenals are just frankly broken. There's an autoimmune disease called Addison's disease, and it's the most common cause of primary adrenal insufficiency. And it's, it's just like Hashimoto's, but it's of the adrenals and not of the thyroid. Now, Hashimoto's exists very commonly along a continuum. There's many people to where the antibodies are barely hurting the thyroid, and there's those to where the thyroid's totally destroyed, but most are somewhere in that continuum. Addison's, there's not as much of a continuum. It's more commonly full-on destruction, but it's not common to have it be a partial type of an issue. So people will often have cortisol levels that are low all day, or maybe they're low sometimes. And a practitioner says, oh, your problem is your cortisol levels are low. That's why you're tired. We should give you cortisol. And the question is, why is the cortisol low? Is it low because the adrenal glands cannot make cortisol? Or is it low because the body's tired and the body's intentionally throttling cortisol output? The body's deliberately wanting the adrenals to make less cortisol. They're very different. And if the body cannot make cortisol, well, it needs it, and that's life or death. But if the body really wants a break from cortisol, that's a whole different situation. And this is a very straightforward thing that can be differentiated. So when someone has abnormal cortisol levels, there is the option you know, with the practitioner, with, with tests, to find out what the body's trying to do. So if someone has insufficiency, as in like Addison's disease, oops, what's going to happen is, I just went crazy here. Let's get back on the right slide. Okay, back on the right slide. Now we'll get the frame back into place. And I'm about to take away these controls from myself. Okay, there's the slide. And let's make this image thing go away. That's what was happening. Okay. <laughs> All right, technical difficulties. Dr. C is the weak link in the chain, but we've got it fixed. Now we're moving forward again. All right, so when the body can't make cortisol, the brain yells for cortisol and ACTH goes really high. But the exact same situation when cortisol is low and the body doesn't want cortisol, ACTH is low or it's normal. It's just that simple. So, so yeah, if someone has a pattern like this, they can very easily know why it's happening, if it's because the body doesn't want cortisol or can't make cortisol. And in almost all cases, we see people that are in these stages, but not this Addison's or this Cushing's. So someone else can be here to where their cortisol is really high. And they think, oh, I've got to make this cortisol go away. My body's making far more than I, than I want. But is it? And this is a way we can distinguish that. If the body really is making too much, that's important to know about. There's reasons for that. But if it's all part of a dysfunction of this axis, that's treated differently. So yeah, very important thing to distinguish. And when someone knows they're at one of these stages, they certainly have the options for the adrenal packs. I made packs for the stressed stage, the wired or tired, and the crashed stage. But the other option, the new formula, I'll talk about this uh, in just a moment, but this can be used for those stages as well. So if someone knows that they're at that stress stage, the new mixture of the adrenal energy, it could be um, two of those once daily. If someone knows they're wired or tired, you know, one twice daily. 
And if they're crashed, two of those twice daily. So that was the big goal is to make this simpler, you know, so you wouldn't have to have different products at different levels of your progression. People tend to heal up. They tend to get better. They need different things as they go. So this is a simpler way to do that. You've got one good blend of ingredients that are all inherently balancing, and you can adjust the amounts of those to target a specific level. So general use of the adrenal energy blend is just two once daily with food. And and that's a great place for just non-specific fatigue. I would always encourage someone to sort out any causes as best they can and try to understand them and discover them and help with them. But along the way, this will address those four big mechanisms, the free radical stress, the poor oxygen delivery, the chronic inflammation, and the immune dysregulation. This is a synergistic blend to make all those things healthier again. And so overall use, that's fine. But if you know you're at one of those levels, there are also ways to adjust the dose and the timing to fit those particular levels. And if someone is on one of the existing packs and doing well, that's great. You know, continue and no need to change. But if you're looking for more solutions for fatigue and simpler solutions and you know, fewer pill counts, this is a great way to go. I have mentioned a few of the ingredients, there's a few more ingredients in here, but I wanted to talk about a few of the highlights. And every one of these is specifically documented to reverse fatigue in humans and either with thyroid disease or in a situation that the benefits would transfer over to the same sort of a situation with thyroid disease and also things that aren't going to force cortisol one direction or another. So no matter where you are in this continuum, you won't make anything worse. You won't hurt anything. You'll only make it better and achieve more balance with the body internally. So yeah, general use, two once daily. And like the others, these are really meant to build upon the daily reset bundle or the daily reset pack. There's a lot of micronutrients that are also helpful for benefiting fatigue, but I wanted those to be not overlapping with what you would get in an appropriate multivitamin. So a lot of them I intentionally left out because they were in the bundle. I didn't want there to be too much and have it become excessive. So that was the main point. You know, a lot of things can give rise to fatigue, but there's a short number of ways in which fatigue manifests in the body. And if you address those particular ways, then fatigue can radically improve. Uh, so that's a that's a cool thing. And I think of all the various clinical benefits that happen, this has got to be one of the most rewarding ones. You know, to see someone to wear they, if, if you don't have energy, you don't have life, you know, because that's, that's really everything we do is just contingent upon us having enough energy to do it or enough energy to want to do it. So to see someone regain that again is the coolest thing because that, that's just regaining life. You know, we, we never have too much of it. <laughs> we always wish we could do more and we never want to have limitations. So that's the beauty about regaining energy. And if you struggle with fatigue, I, I really want there to be solutions for you. I worked hard to make this a new one. I think it's been very effective and very helpful for people. We've seen some good feedback on that already. So I'm going to wrap up on Instagram. Uh, thanks for joining me, you all, tonight. I will see you all very soon. Oh, I just saw, I saw one comment. It's about to close out Instagram. Um, if I'm hypothyroid, should I not be taking L-carnitine? Nope. I meant to say you can. <laughs> it's, it's actually fine. But I wouldn't so much just take it by itself. If it makes sense in the context of treating fatigue, or if it makes sense in the context of metabolism boost, but I wouldn't use it as a standalone product, but it won't make hypothyroidism worse. So there was a good one there. But good night, Instagram. I'll see you guys soon. And you can come on over to the uh, studio audience if you want to join us. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. Now it's just us, you guys. <laughs> I'm going to reposition some things here. Let me get the stop my screen share stop the share there we go i can put the slides away i'll leave them down in case a question was about them and now it's just us i'm seeing a lot of you guys here tonight we've got a heck of a good group yeah there was some big thing going on in tv whatever <laughs> i think everyone's here tonight that's cool <laughs> So let's grab a few questions here. Um, and I'm in a later time zone than I normally am. So forgive me if I'm not on for too terribly long, but <laughs> I've, I've been, uh, yeah, I finished the manuscript this morning. Well, 
yesterday. I thought it was yesterday, but actually ended up being this morning that I finished it. And it's been about a week and a half in the middle of nowhere here. And I've got on this totally goofy schedule. I'm going to sleep at like 6.30 or 7 and waking up at like 3 or so. And <laughs> so bedtime drifted even further. Now when I go back to my own time zone, it's going to be even worse. But okay, so participants, hands up. Cool. And let's grab some questions. And I'm seeing a lot of familiar names here. Krista, Krista, how the heck are you doing? Asked on you, go for it. It's so great to see you again, Dr. C. Hey, good to see you too. Thank How's you so much you? for this. Um, what's that? How's life treating you? Pretty great. Good, good. Thank you. And your doctors are great. Everything's good. Super cool. excited about this adrenal support. I need it. Dr. Raquel <laughs> told me. So that's <laughs> all good. Thank you. I have a quick question from your lab. I think it was last week. So I apologize. But regarding the... Thank you. The antibodies support. If I, is the antibodies support primarily for those over a hundred? Because I know it's not as big of an issue if you're under a hundred and your antibodies, or will it still, will we still benefit from it? It's not going to hurt anyone wherever the levels are. They're all food-like ingredients. I was just talking about when is it the highest priority? You know, there's those that wish to have them come down at varying levels and it's, it's fine for whatever levels you're at. Okay. So we may be able to see them come down more from where we're at. You know, do full court press, you know, do them definitely be on the, the thyroid reset diet, you know, work with Dr. Raquel and yeah, that's very, very plausible. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good to see you. You too. Take care. You bet. Okay, so I'm going to lower hand. There we go. Maggie, how are you tonight? Good to see you again here. I think I hit the last unmute. Yep, there you go. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. You're doing great. Oh, okay. Thank you for taking my question. I have a follow-up question to something I asked you before. Um, sure. This was about the antibody. Uh, I brought out my question. And I told you how I reduced my um, my TSH from 73.72 to 11.12. And I also reduced my iodine after reading your book. Last time you recommended that I do this urinary iodine to creatinine ratio to test, which I did do. And I got the results back and it said that the iodine urine was not detect, none detected, the creatinine 0.96. But then the thing the, the ratio thing said, unable to calculate results since non-numeric result obtained from component test. Does that mean yeah. does that mean that I have no iodine in my system? Or what does no, that you mean? No, you got a you got a you got a goofy reading. Just redo that. Oh really? Yeah, that, that, that that didn't come out right somehow. Because it said it was veri verified by repeat analysis and it said limit of quantitation of 20. So I figured that meant they did it 20 times. But <laughs> does that sound right? No. <laughs> you got a goofy reading somehow. Okay, so it can't really be zero. That's not real. No, no. Okay. Can I tell them that? Like it was zero and that can't be right? Yep. Yeah, just redo okay. that. Okay. Okay. So There's like, that happens a lot to laboratory analysis, actually. A lot of readings don't come out right. Okay. Okay. That was easy enough. Okay. Thank you so much for taking my question. You're welcome. Hey, Joanne, how the heck have you been? Hi. There I've been go. doing well. I've been listening in to all of these, but I really haven't had any questions till this one. <laughs> well, I'm glad you had one. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You too, Dr. C. Okay. Um, I kind of got log winded. It's on the Facebook with the private thyroid group that you didn't get a chance to answer because you were busy working on the new book. So I'm going to get caught up again the next couple of days. I'm yes, sorry. Yes. So my <laughs> question is I'm backtracking to the thyrotropin. Uh -huh. And um, you had said that melatonin increases thyroid volume. And my ultrasounds come back saying my thyroid is mildly heterogeneous. Atropic, heterogeneous, yep. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, atropic thyroid gland without nodules or cysts. So in other words, it's shriveling up. Mm -hmm. So will the thyrotropin actually maybe help me? I've had Hashimoto's for 16 years. 
I don't know if there'd be a measurable change and I, I should be precise. So if, if someone has uh, impaired sleep, that can be one factor that compounds thyroid reduction in volume. So in that case, then the restoration of melatonin can help to offset that. If, if someone already has normal sleep and the thyroid is atrophied for other reasons, it wouldn't be a factor. So it's not so much that melatonin's miracle grow in the thyroid, it's more so that a lack of it can escalate atrophic thyroiditis, if that makes sense. You kind of lost me. I, for the most <laughs> part, I sleep well. Okay, it's probably not going to be useful for you then if your sleep is not an issue. If your sleep was an issue, things that would help the sleep could be helpful that way. But if your sleep is fine, it wouldn't change things on top of that. Okay, yeah, because my, my sleep is fine. Okay, so, um, all right, thank you. You're welcome. We'll see ya. Good to see you. <laughs> Johanna, Johanna, I don't know if the H is pronounced or not, but you are up next. Welcome, welcome in tonight. Hello. Hey there. Is the Hi. H kidney sound or not? Is it Joanna or Johanna? Either way, it's fine. <laughs> Why do you say it? Thank you for checking. Um, I I say Johanna, but my relatives Johanna, say Johanna. Johanna it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so first, I just wanted to take a few seconds to to just share how incredibly grateful I am for all your work. I've been reading your work for years, and I was one of those classic cases of feeling like crap for 10 years, but my thyroid, my TSH not being high enough. And then I worked with Dr. Raquel for a while and it's, it's just completely turned my life around. So that's awesome. That's really um, cool. Yeah. So at this point, I, I, I'm, my energy is so much better than it used to be, but I'm looking forward to kind of, getting all the way there with like I said nobody gets too much (laughs) right right Um, I'll take more if I can get it (laughs) (laughs) yeah Um, so a couple of of quick questions around sodium I I could be totally wrong about this but I feel like I had heard from a doctor that there could be a relationship between sodium level and cortisol management is yeah is so is is that a thing and then also um uh what is the optimal sodium level yeah yeah great question so this one does come up and there and as in most cases there's some kernel of truth so the kernel of truth is that uh cortisol is a glucocorticoid, it's a glucose regulating hormone. It's also a mineralocorticoid, it's a mineral regulating hormone. And there's other adrenal hormones are even more specific for their effects on the minerals, like uh, aldosterone, for example. But in cases of adrenal insufficiency, where the body cannot make adrenal hormones, it, that can be a cause of low sodium or hyponatremia. And the threshold in the blood is about 135 nanograms per mil. The further sodium gets below that, the more there can be a lack of it. And this is interesting. There, there are ways by which yeah, low cortisol can give rise to that. It can occur for other reasons altogether. And there can be those that have adrenal abnormalities but don't have it affect their sodium. I have seen some of the adrenal experts say that everyone has to pour salt in water and drink lots of salt and stuff to boost up their adrenals. It doesn't really do that. <laughs> um, oddly, there's also a lot of differences in how we excrete sodium. So for many people, if they consume a lot, they pee more out and they get in a vicious cycle of losing more and more because they're consuming more and more. So by and large, it's not a strategy that's helpful across the board. There are some specific instances where someone does need help. Either they need more than is typical or they're excreting too much. Those things can come up. But as a general statement, it's not, a, not something to really focus in on. Uh, I don't worry about most people having to overduly restrict salt. You know, if you're avoiding heavily processed foods, cooking at home, you usually come out okay with that. But, but yeah, you don't really need to add salt in otherwise. Got it. Thank you. And um, mm-hmm. uh, if I may ask you a super quick question, you said something earlier about, um, just, I was like three minutes late and you were in the middle of talking about this when I joined. Um, so, um, elevated CRP, um, so high inflammation marker, 
Mm -hmm. um, is it possible that this can be um, traced back to hypothyroidism or cortisol management? I, I mean, like when you've already addressed all kinds of other things, like possibly food sensitivities, gut health, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. So C-reactive protein is interesting. A lot of blood markers mean one thing by different amounts, you know, but CRP means different things at its different amounts. So there's, there's CRP and there's high sensitive CRP. They're the exact same thing, but there's a different range that they're given. So high sensitive CRP is flagged as abnormal when it's greater than one. And uh, normal CRP is flagged as abnormal when it's greater than five, but they're the same test. So in either case, if you're below one, you're pretty clear. If you're between one and three, there's likely some circulating vascular inflammation, meaning that it's a cardiovascular risk factor. If it's in the three to 10 range, it's more likely to be from the gastrointestinal tract. And then if it's well above 10, it's more likely a sign of chronic musculoskeletal or joint inflammation. So yeah, so the number gives some clues on the origin of it for C-reactive protein. Awesome. Thanks a bunch. You're welcome. Let's grab a couple more. Donna, no video here. If you can join on video, you're welcome to, but let's hear what you got for us. Hi there, Dr. C. I, um, I have Addison's disease. Um, okay. I was diagnosed about seven years ago. Um, when I was younger, I had acne and then developed fibrocystic breast disease, endometriosis, stage four, hypothyroidism, and then finally, most recently, Addison's. Um, and so I feel like there's this progression with my endocrine system that just keeps getting worse. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you can point to anything that would help um, help me to get to a root cause on some of these things. I take a ton of supplements um, and learned that I shouldn't be eating a lot of carbs in the evening. Um, just to help my body tell me when to go to sleep at the right time. But um, you learned that you should or you should not. Did not. I don't really get tired until midnight. And if I don't eat sugar or pastas or carbs after dinner, that doesn't seem to be as bad. I, I go to bed earlier. Um, I sleep really well and I always sleep about nine hours when I feel good. So it seems like that's not a big problem except for when I sleep. Um, but I'm wondering if you see a thread through that um, on something that I can be addressing for root cause on all of this and um, and then also I just recently had a bout of skin cancer. So I'm wondering if there's inflammation, um, or something that you see coming throughout that kind of driving all these things, like if they're connected. Well, they're connected, but not always in a helpful way. So when one has one version of an autoimmune disease, there are higher risks for others. The skin cancer is not connected to those, but okay. overall with one disease risks are a little bit higher. Now by a little bit higher, you know, in your case, when something does happen, it might as well be 100% because it happened. But in terms of populations, for example, having, uh, having Addison's disease in general is about three to five cases per million in the population. So it's quite rare. Now, if someone has Hashimoto's disease, they've got about two to three times the chance of having Addison's. So on one set of looking at the numbers, two to three times sounds like a lot. But on the other set of looking at it, you know, out of a few per million, it goes up like 15 per million rather than five per million. So again, for you, that's not really useful because it, it happened. But the risks for other autoimmune disease past those two are kind of similar. So the odds of more showing up are higher, the relative risk is higher, but the absolute risk is still rather low. So overall, the odds of other ones showing up are still quite unlikely. Like lightning has struck twice for you, well, not twice, but once, you know, the thyroid disease is not that rare, but Addison's is rather rare. And they're both, there's some core susceptibility, but there's really no clear known triggers for the Addison's. With thyroid disease, the biggest things we know about are just age, female gender, the iodine, so we're aware of those. But yeah, otherwise, you're, there's not really one thing that ties them together besides this underlying susceptibility. Okay. And I'm doing a lot of ashwagandha and, and adrenal support that's not overstimulating. Um, I'm wondering if you think the the adrenal reset and those types of things that you're offering are still appropriate in my situation. I know if I get overstimulated, that's a bad thing. I've managed For to sure. get 
down to only five milligrams a day of the hydrocortisone in hopes of, of regaining function on some level. Um, so I'm wondering what you think about the compatibility of those things. Yeah, those things are compatible. I, I would think a lot, and, I, and that's really in alignment with what I was saying about not wanting things that force that force cortisol around. You want things that are more so buffering and stabilizing because it's, that's especially true when you're dependent upon external sources of cortisol. So I would really minimize a lot of adaptogens or adrenal compounds per se, apart from those that are known to have more of a homeostatic effect like the adrenal energy. Like the pinning ginseng, do you think that would be appropriate? In the context of a formula, I do. You know, most of these herbs in historical use, they were never done in isolation. They were always done in context of formulations. And there was a lot of reasons for that. They have many properties that others can balance well. And one of my one of my former uh, careers was actually Chinese herbal medicine. So back in the day, I used to have the massive, uh, massive shelf with hundreds and hundreds of glass and jars of these bowl of Chinese herbs, and I would mix those up custom. But I got a sense about, you know, how formulations have to evolve and how one thing has to work with something else. So that's also a lot of what I put into the formulation is that is that perspective. Okay, thanks. I'll be back next week for the low iron. I had pretty good energy until this last July and it tanked and my iron dropped. So I'll be... That can be a big factor. That should be useful for you. I'm very interested in, in hearing next week too. Thank you for doing this. You're welcome. Let me get the mute caught up again. There we go. Okay. Uh, Emily, you are up next. Let's hear what you've got this evening. Hi, Dr. C. Thank you for hey, taking Emily. my... Uh, Thank you for taking my question. I um, read your Adrenal Reset Diet book years ago when I was suffering from the tail end of Lyme disease, and I really was able to get very much on a stable level after doing that. Yay. So I recommend your work to so many of my patients. I'm an acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist now. Oh, that's cool. Um, just talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I heard you just talking about the jars and, you know, I've, I've definitely done all that. So um, I, I had some I had dried just gecko back of, in the day that was fun to scare kids with. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you ever seen those? I I have. Yeah. And I've seen, you know, the scorpion and the um, centipede. Centipede. Um, <laughs> And now I recognize it as, as potentially good medicine for, for nerve disorders. So anyway, um, I, I had a question about the cordyceps because I think, as you know, being a Chinese medicine practitioner, it's really hard to get real cordyceps and good cordyceps. So I'm just kind of curious, like how you source it, where you get it and, and how you verify it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great questions. And those are important points. That's one of the reasons why the project took a couple of years. So thankfully, I've had a lot of sources that I've used off and on since about like 94, I was able to draw upon. But uh, HPLC analysis, as far as verification, we've got spectrographic analysis for active subtypes and cordonopsin A and B being quite relevant. But that's something that is an ongoing process and also concerns about uh, microbiologic heavy metal contaminations. So yeah, full analysis on, on all batches. And a lot of raw material suppliers we just don't use. We've tested many things and just rejected, and that's just ongoing. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, my second question on the ginseng, are you using American ginseng or um, Asian ginseng? So it's actually Korean. That's the one I was referring to there in okay. this one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because that's like a more like, you know, they're different. Like that's a more warming kind of mm -hmm. substance. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. That was it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Gay, you are up. I'm asked to unmute here and go for it. Oops. Uh, Hello. Can there you go. Can you hear me? All right. I can hear you just fine. Doing great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, wow. Those, those graphs are uh, just the kind of what I wanted to ask you about um, <laughs> uh, my recent adrenal test um, results. But first, uh, it's very confusing. But first, I wanted to talk about um, 
because I think it plays in with my severe case of restless leg syndrome, which I've had for years. And um, I finally, a few years ago, I started taking Mirapex. I'd been, you know, up in the middle of the night, jumping up and down and I exercise two, three hours a day as it is. And tennis really helped. And it would help at night. I'd go out and hit balls on the wall near where I lived. And But now it's like the exercise doesn't really help. And I've noticed that, that the sugar, any sugar and caffeine within 12 hours of when I go to sleep, which is usually around nine, you know, is... Um, it's just more, I'm getting more, more sensitive to that. So, I mean, in a way it's a silver lining because you, you know, just need to stay away from sugar and get in the <laughs> Yeah. And am I supposed to be able to see you? Um, I can't see you. I don't, I don't understand. What, but anyway, <laughs> so, um, I, anyway, where's the thing? So, um, the, the mirror packs, it takes two hours to, to kick in, you know, and if I don't take it, I've had nights where I just was screaming, you know, I mean, it's like worms crying up my leg. And it's usually one leg now, my right leg. And um, so uh, anyway, uh, I've noticed also like last night was good. I hardly had any sugar all day and I really slept. Well. But the thing is that that I usually have been taking a little more than the prescribed dose of the mirror packs. And um, so as a result, um you know, that, that leads, that's augmentation, right? I mean, I've been to some work groups on that and I really don't, um, I'm concerned let's, let's about, you know. Let's one in on a question there, Gay. <laughs> um, oh, you want me to get off of that? All right. Um, the, the, I can't the help questions. With All right. Well, I just thought because my, my adrenals test is, I see I, I'm wide awake at sometimes three in the morning. I thought it was my cortisol kicking in with low blood sugar or something. But what happens is I'm rearing to go by five in the morning. And yet my cortisol levels, according to this test here, um, are low in the morning and then normal between 11 and five and then high, but from 10 to midnight. But that's so that's so when I so I'm, my, my apologies, I wanted, when I was saying I couldn't help with that, I was saying the mirror packs, I couldn't get into the medical management. It's not something I'm very familiar with or I can do in this context. But in terms of restless leg syndrome, that can be quite relevant to your adrenal health. And that goes back to the correlation between cortisol and electrolytes and nerve conduction. So what you're describing sounds like the wired and tired pattern where the morning is low and the nighttime is high. Did I hear that correct? Yes, it's just that I feel the opposite. That's what I don't understand. Sure. Well, and that's why it's not so much based upon purely symptoms, and you don't have the clear symptoms at a clear time when, when the rhythm is off. So you can have a lot of different symptom, symptom, symptom patterns and symptom timings, but that still falls under that wired and tired pattern, and that, that's the value of testing. Well, that's what my naturopath was saying. It was last week I got the results, and she was saying that um, she thinks it's adrenal fatigue, and I just wanted to learn more about it from you because I, I, I yeah, just so don't the, understand. You know, funny thing, I don't, I don't love the term adrenal fatigue because what it implies is that <laughs> someone who, who spoke a few moments ago has Addison's disease, and in that case, her adrenals, you could say they're fatigued. They can't make the hormone yet that we wish that they could, and so many have had led us to think that that happens to everyone that has abnormal cortisol and it doesn't. So your adrenals are not fatigued. You know, your adrenals are not at a proper daily circadian rhythm, but not because they're fatigued and not because they're weakened. So the mistaken model is that stress makes your adrenals tired and it makes them goof up. It's not true. Stress causes your body's hypothalamus, pituitary and adrenal axis to go out of its timing rhythm. And it's an important distinction because if it were just a matter of the adrenals being fatigued, we would just give everyone cortisol and call it good. But that's not the solution. And that's, it's not a lack of cortisol. It's a lack of regulation. And so that's also why things that help regulation can help even if cortisol is quite abnormal. You know, once your body gets more capable of timing it right, it can fix that quite well. If you've not looked at it, please grab the adrenal reset diet. And I wrote a whole chapter about wired and tired and all the things that can be helpful for that. In terms of the adrenal energy blend, that's the nutraceutical mixture I would recommend the most highly for that pattern. And that's quite simply one capsule in the morning and one capsule in the evening. And that's really formulated for those purposes. But yeah, grab that. I think that the link for shopping is in our chat. And then the adrenal reset diet, grab that and look at the uh, wired and tired chapter. The whole chapter is about dietary lifestyle strategies and all sorts of things can be useful for you. 
Yeah, I wrote it down because I do want to look into it. So, yeah, that's good. They they put me in zone four. It's a depressed DEA. You didn't talk about DHEA. You were talking about something else. I, I, I'm i recording it so I can listen. But yeah, the DHEA, something that's you don't. I mean, it's a I, separate I variable. I did talk about that in the book as well, but it's not part of the diagnostic oh. criteria for the adrenal for the cortisol stages. Oh, well, according to this, it is. This is Diagnostics Lab that yep. I sent it to. Yep. Yeah, they wrote that chart like in about 98. And yeah, the book that I wrote was more recent. Things have changed over the years. Okay, well, good. That's, that's definitely a good reason to get it done. Um, All right, good question. Let's grab a couple more here still tonight. Uh, let's get, we got Kathy here. Looks like Kathy's a nurse practitioner. That's cool. How are you doing, Kathy? I'm great, Dr. Christensen. Thank you for taking my uh, time here. I actually used to live in Arizona, but I'm from Oh, that's Kansas. awesome. So, You're from um, where? From Kansas. So I'm back in okay. Kansas. Do a rural ER hospital now, so um, I so you can't say that we're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. No, huh? no we're not. <laughs> I'm back, and weather's being bipolar. We were snowstorm last week and snowed in, and now it's 75 degrees. So, <laughs> oh, wow, that's crazy. So I did, um, being in Yuma, I had the opportunity to come and see Dr. Ross for a few years and also used your Adrenal Reset book um, in my practice. But unfortunately, in 2016, just suddenly got very, very ill, um, had all sorts of proximal muscle weakness. Nobody could figure out what it was. They thought I was just passing away. Um, your story hit home. I had just read your story in the Adrenal Reset Diet about the other practitioner that the same thing had kind of happened. And I lost my practice for about four months. Um, but uh, of course, they slammed me on a bunch of cortisol. And I'm kind of like the other Addison's patient. Nobody's ever given me the term Addison's, but mm -hmm. my cortisol test at Mayo was non-existent. They couldn't even, they had to give me uh Cortef just to get me back out of the building. I was in a wheelchair. Um, so have three children and Dr. Roz actually found that I had MTHFR deficient or um, antibody or, you know, MTHFR at the time. And I was diagnosed with POTS dysautonomia. So my question is, Dr. Um, is, I mean, I'm getting ready to set back up with Dr. Ross to do some telemedicine stuff and get tuned. Good, back. good. Got myself down to 20 of Cortef, like the other lady. I'm like, I'm just praying, but I can make it <laughs> five, by five and I just crash. Like I can't even hold my body up or, or see a patient. So mm -hmm. like what she asked, are we safe to go ahead being on that? I've done the Aleuth report. We tried to do an Aleuth report taper. One of the other colleagues, one of your colleagues and I did for quite some time. And it just, I kept crashing and they were having to give it me, um, I am, saw you Cortef. So am I safe to, to take that adrenal, the new one that you've got, or kind of what could I, I mean, 80 pounds later, and I used to be a runner, have three children, and uh, and I just want to be back to normal, and I want to be able, I pull 724s in a row out here in Southwest Kansas. So, You're kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting a lot, you know, but like the last two days, I told my husband, I said, I think, and he's a critical care respiratory therapist working down in Texas. But um, I said, honey, I'm just tired. He said, well, you just came off maybe your body. And I said, no, this is different tired. I think it's my adrenals. So that's why I had to see this coming on today. But I just really want to get back into some of that, you know, and see what I can do to get this 80 pounds off and uh, get back to being the mom I want to be, you know. You know, that's, that's awesome. I think you can still improve a lot further. I just want my mind. <laughs> so one quick piece of feedback. I mentioned at the beginning about like being tired and being fatigued. Yes. The kind of hours you're putting in, I think that's tired. I don't think that's fatigue. <laughs> well, I actually had slept though, like two days straight. I hadn't, I didn't because I'm in such a, I'm in a town of four, 900 people. So, you know, once I see my couple hospital patients, I'm done, you know, and I'm just hanging out at the coach. I'm in a motor home and just chilling out, reading a book. And so it's just weird that, you know, I just get to where I can't even hold my body up at times, you know? Yeah. Well, so one big thing is just pacing yourself, you know, your, your schedule and the hours and the, the rhythm and the cycles of the day. That That's an indefens indispensable part of it. Okay. You know? But can Pushing I as hard as you are, like that adrenal energy. You think too? You certainly cortex? can. You know, no, no drawback. That's safe to include. And and with the Cortef, so the the biggest drawback about that is when that plus your output is above physiologic. Yeah. You know, if it, basically if you didn't need it, that's the most harmful. Or if you're taking a dose that's way above your body's requirements. You know, a typical adults going to make somewhere around like 25, 30 milligrams of cortisol per day. 
a rather straight equivalency in terms of core TEF milligrams. Mm -hmm. So the further you are above that, the more there's just inescapable side effects. But if you're not making much, you're within a physiologic dose, you're much better having it than not. And I totally agree that it, it's cooler to need less, but mm -hmm. it's healthier to have some than not have any. <laughs> you yeah, no, have I don't function from I somewhere. Don't function. I can't hold my head up. I can't raise my arms, my proximal thighs. My husband would transfer me and everything. So, you know, some sometimes people can do quite well if they have uh, a broad coverage of glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid with their prescriber. So, some some endos will also include small amounts of fluoronef, of DHEA, of pregnenolone, and sometimes a more even distribution can mimic your body's output and make you need less of any one total. So that's that's one strategy that yeah. you and your prescriber can talk about. I had like 1,400 out in, uh, or 14,000 out in an eight hour period when they put me on the fluoronef, I went into overload. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, yeah. well, I'm going to holler at her, but uh, but yeah, I definitely wanted to see if I couldn't get started on that adrenal energy. You, and, you sure can. <laughs> and next, next case study you need to put in that book, It's I got, the good, I got a good case study for you. <laughs> Thank you for all you do. I've used it on a lot of patients, and a lot of patients have really, really had life-changing. So thank you so much. That's cool. Yeah, stay in touch. You're going to hear how things go for you. Okay, I will. Thank you so much. You bet. Let's get a couple more here tonight. Um, so Sean has cortisol in part of the name. I can't say the full name, but cortisol is part of that. I'm intrigued. So Sean, what have you got for us? So cortisol slash thyroid question. Huh, right yeah. in your Zoom name. That's pretty clever. Yeah. <laughs> excellent. You're able to hear me? I can. You're yeah, doing great. Excellent. So, so I do have a question pertaining to today's discussion. How does one accurately distinguish between stress and Cushing's and can either directly impact thyroid function. I'll give you a little bit okay. of context. Uh, if one has out of range elevated morning serum cortisol, just slightly out of range, and three separate elevated 24 hour urine cortisol tests that are double the reference range, not exceptionally high, but double the reference range. How do you mm -hmm. as a practitioner determine the root cause of that elevated cortisol and what one needs to do to resolve this situation? I was just hoping you could kind of walk us through your differential diagnosis and protocol. I sure can, you know, and I really just buzzed through this pretty quickly, but let me take a little yeah. more time on that to answer your question. So if I did this right, my screen's up again, you can see the yep. slide, did that work out? Okay, yes, so what you're you. asking about is, is right here, basically. And when, if someone is high cortisol from stress, uh, stress in a vague lay sense or stressed as in these levels, when cortisol is high for those reasons, the main difference we'll see is that the body is intentionally pushing it up so that there's, a high demand on the adrenals. ACTH is going to be high, normal, or elevated. Whereas with Cushing's or Cushingoid syndromes, there's a lot of situations in which the adrenals overproduce or non-adrenal tissue makes cortisol. So there's things like pheochromocytoma or stuff to where cortisol comes from elsewhere. But in those cases, the body is saying, hey, you know, don't do that. And ACTH becomes low. So when there's unwanted cortisol, ACTH goes down. And if the body is heightening cortisol as part of this overall HPA dysregulation, then ACTH is high, normal, or high. So that's the that's a simple differentiation for the first step. And as far as diagnosing the exact cause uh, versus some subtype of, of Cushing's, there's many, many other steps for that. But quickly just seeing if the body is trying to do it or not, ACTH makes that distinction. Excellent. And do um, one one when one can differentiate between those two accurately, do both equally affect the thyroid or does only Cushing's impact thyroid function? So in terms of um, uh, releasing hormone, in terms of um, cell receptor um, blocking or, you know, the very uh, deiodinase uh, tr transformation. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So very savvy question. And really the results are the same. They're conditional upon the cortisol levels. So uh -huh. in, in there are certainly many cases in which pheochromocytoma or Cushing's can have cortisol levels that are far beyond what happens from a heightened stress response, but there is also some overlap. And so in those cases, the degree to which those facets of thyroid function are altered is the degree to which the cortisol is dysregulated. Excellent. So equivocally, both can impact the thyroid. Thank you very much for taking yep. the time to answer this question. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Very good questions. Appreciate them. 
Okay, let's get a couple more. Let me update my mutes again here real quick. Um, there we go. All right, two, let's get two more. Um, ah, heck. Um, let's get let's get David here for one. Go for it, David. <laughs> you look startled. <laughs> I don't hear your audio just yet, my friend. There you go. Okay, just really quick, simple questions about shopping at your store. So it seems to me the basics are to, first of all, to have a, a general multivitamin. So I've used your daily uh, reset pack for many years as a multivitamin. And now I see that there's a new one with thyroid specific formulation. So that got me confused. Um, <laughs> oh, and you see, that's what I have in the past. Uh, so I see what that was. Is that the oh. Fresh Start Essentials or? No, that's that's yours. Um, right, right, right. Oh, the thyroid daily essentials. There you go. Yep, that's that's yep. I've actually always been confused by these, and I told my mom to take it, and she says, "Oh, it has thyroid on it, so I can't take it." But I said it is a multivitamin, so I've it always, is. actually never been clear on these. What is the multivitamin everyone should start with? The really so there's there's that one, and the one that I would encourage now as a foundation is just the thyroid daily essentials. And that can be taken by here. itself. Okay. Uh, the that's that's yours. Yeah. Thyroid, yep. thyroid daily essentials. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing a note from Josh here. Let me pull this up real quick. Um, because I can't see your image very well for whatever reason. Oh, hmm. Yeah, it's in the. That that's that's one of the constituents of the daily reset pack. Right. So the thyroid the thyroid daily, I'm sorry, is the proper name for the newer one, the thyroid specific formulations. So what you got is great. When you finish that up, I would switch to the, the thyroid daily. And that's that's basically basically a concentrated form of that where it's one a day. So it's one capsule once daily. And that can be done by itself, or that can be done as part of the daily reset bundle, which is it plus calcium, magnesium, and fish oil. Okay, so the daily reset pack, I think it's around eighty, ninety dollars or something. And the new daily one reset is, pack, there's the pack and the bundle. <laughs> and the new and one's like different. fifty, sixty bucks. Is right. there something like less about it, or um, so? No, I concentrated it further, and I okay. I reduced the B vitamins on purpose, but I actually augmented a few other minerals. Uh, one thing about thyroid specific formulations is I wanted things to be cost effective for people. That was one piece of feedback that I got quite a bit is that, you know, for many costs could be a barrier for things. And I wanted it to be less and less of a factor. So I worked hard to reformulate and do things in a way to where it could be the most precise, but end up being more cost effective. There were some ingredients in the thyroid, uh, the, the daily reset pack that were also to benefit deiodinase pathways. And those were the sort of things that I used in the specific formulations, like the antibody support or the uh, hyperthyroid support. So the thought with thyroid specific is, here's the multi that's just essential for the multi. And then if you want some other purpose, do that on top of it. So mm -hmm. it was, everything could be more specific. That's one way I got it to be fewer pills and more cost effective. So daily reset pack, what you had for years, is that going away then? No. There's okay. still a lot of folks that love that. And the, okay. the biggest difference is that it's a higher dose of B vitamins and some okay. prefer that. But okay. those that do better on lower dose B vitamins and fewer pills than the daily reset bundles for them. Okay, thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, fair questions. Um, okay, let's see. Let's get at least one more. Uh, Catherine, let's hear what you've got for us this evening. Hi. Um, hey, Catherine. Hi, um, I really enjoy your program. Uh, it's really informative. I I buy your books through the years, and uh, it's helped me a lot. One of the things I've run into is not just in your form your formulation of the adrenals is I'm not able to take the Panax ginseng. I'm definitely mm -hmm. allergic. So, is there anything else I can be looking for for an adrenal? For sure. Yeah, I have to look through all the formulations. But in that case, I would think about the existing adrenal reset packs. And those are on drchristensen.com. Uh, we've got several that are that are free of Panax. So yeah, that's totally an option for you. Okay. 
And the other thing I got, David got me thinking, uh, when you're on a compound thyroid medicine, are you able to take any urothyroid formulas along with it or if it's not recommended? Well, so the compound of the concern, of course, is just regulation, but any thyroid medication. So when you say take things along with that, um, I think of that in two ways. So one way is you put these pills in your hand, you you wash them down. So in that way, no, nothing goes along with thyroid medication. <laughs> you take nothing at the same time. Oh, as yeah, it. I understand that. Now, the other way you could mean that is I take my thyroid in the morning, morning and later on I take this, then, then yes, then yes, you can take those things. And of course, that's that's always dependent upon your doctor's specific input, but there's no contraindication between any of the TSF products and any thyroid medications. They're all made to be compatible in that sense. Oh, okay. And the other thing is, um, the last time I spoke with you was a, not this past time, but um, the time before on the adrenals, when I would have brought up on the cortisol. Um, Crash, is that in the adrenal reset book? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep, there's a full chapter on that one too. Yeah, I'm going to be purchasing it. So I yeah. will you know. <laughs> good, good questions. Uh, so I'm going to get one more question and I want to give you guys a heads up notice. Please do put questions in chat. Uh, Josh is there. Josh is crazy smart. He's given a lot of good feedback to questions that, that he can. And if nothing else, I will see those. And you're welcome to talk about these at our next week we come back for next week for discussion or future office hours but i always read these questions and some of them i just reach out directly to and give answers to other times that that's things that i'll use to write about for blog topics so I'm, I'm, i'll tell you right now i'm going to grab tracy's hers is next up on this line so if you've got a question hand up and you're not tracy <laughs> please put it down in chat and forgive me but I am fading. It's past bedtime for me. So I'll grab one more and we'll wrap that up. So yeah, get your question in chat. Otherwise, I'll see it. We'll cover it in some way. And Tracy, you are up. Let's hear what you got this evening. Okay. Um, hey, wow, I was, just about to, I was just about to go into the chat and, and print this out or uh, speak it out. Anyway, thank you for um, doing all this. This is fantastic. Uh, appreciate welcome. your time. So I was put on NP thyroid. Um, I've had a history like five years of my TSH being higher than five. Mm -hmm. And then, so my endocrinologist put me on MP thyroid um, within the last year, like beginning of 2021, and then started at 15, bumped up to 30 milligrams. I felt even worse. I felt really anxious. So she bumped it back down to 15 milligrams and I still wasn't feeling too well. I still had that anxiety. And um, I asked her if I could just like wean off of it. Um, and she said something like, I, I thought she said I'd have to be on it for the rest of my life or something like that. Wow. And, I, and that kind of freaked me out that I didn't really want to. An Yeah. That's surprising. Yeah. So, but then she said, okay. Um, anyway, if you want to go back down to the 15 milligrams and just do 15 milligrams, like every three days. And so I've been doing that. And since that, that um, my TSH came down lower than it's ever been um, to 2.4. And it, in my history, like I'm talking five years back, I, I, I kept these charts. I have never been that, that low. And so now I'm wondering, am I stuck on this 15 milligrams every three days? I wanted your professional opinion. So, so Tracy, your TSH has been in the five range, you said, right? Yeah, five, six, yeah. seven, even. So yeah. five, six, seven, was your T4 below range at all? Or was that measured? Um, I just have free T4. Yeah, same, same thing. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And that's been, that's been normal, I guess, if normal yeah. range is like 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Yeah, that's what I expected. So we would call that subclinical hypothyroidism. And overt hypothyroidism is where the TSH is often in like the 10 to 15 range, plus the T4 gets well below range. That's overt hypothyroidism. So sub so there's there's we think about this differently for someone who's not on medication and someone who is. So thyroid levels like that, sometimes they are associated with symptoms for people. They can cause a lot of the classic thyroid symptoms. Uh, but the question is, does it help to go on medication? So with subclinical hypothyroidism, 
yes, that can cause symptoms. It may cause cardiovascular risk. It does correlate with the higher risk of your thyroid going to it's nine o'clock. hypothyroidism. Uh, but there's, there's no real correlation. There's med- medicine doesn't help is a short answer. There's been a lot of big papers showing that people that are, have subclinical disease, medications don't improve those sorts of things. They don't help them lose weight. They don't help them feel less tired. They don't cut their risk of the thyroid progressing, but many end up on treatment. So, so yeah, that's kind of surprising because most endocrinologists are aware of that. So where you are, that's a really good time to consider the thyroid reset diet, especially, and to consider some nutraceuticals, but it's common medications don't help symptoms. If your TSH went down, it probably would have anyway, because you're taking such a small amount that's barely of any relevance, but it's especially true when someone takes a small dose and they feel worse from that in various ways, because your body, your body is keeping up. Your, your pituitary is saying your thyroid needs to work harder, but your thyroid is working harder to compensate. So your thyroid hasn't quit. So yeah, you're really not in a situation to where the guidelines suggest starting on medication. There's no guideline saying that would be helpful for you to do so. Okay, so I think what I heard you to say that I could get off of the MP and do nutraceuticals. I, I can't tell someone to change medication, but sure, in, the, sure. in the case in the case of subclinical hypothyroidism, there's been no clear benefit to using medication for that. So yeah. So what do you what do you think? Um, maybe I missed this. What do you think brought it down? What did I did I do something differently? I don't know. <laughs> you may <laughs> have. You're not taking enough thyroid to radically change it at all, but you might have. If you've not, if you're not aware of the thyroid reset diet, take a peek at that. You can totally turn the odds of that turning around are in the 97 percent range. Okay. Well, I am going to look into that because um, I mean I'm a health and wellness coach, and I I do coach a lot of people, and I obviously I'm not coaching myself, but I my diet is very. Very so lean. it's not really a matter of, of lean or good or bad or diet or anything at all. It's just iodine. So thyroid disease oh. is the controllable factor is iodine. And the, the crazy paradox, we always know that we need some iodine for our thyroid. That's totally true. But many people, I should back up a bit. Um, many people are sensitive to a little bit too much. And for those people, a tiny bit of extra iodine actually slows down the thyroid. So with subclinical hypothyroidism, there's been multiple clinical trials in which they've taken people and put them on iodine reduced diets. And if you, some people don't comply with the diet, so let's put them over here. But of those who comply with the diet, uh, roughly 80% have perfectly normal thyroid function in three months. And the remaining 17% see big improvements in their thyroid function within three months. So yeah, so people get better very consistently with just that step. And the thyroid reset diet is all about that. It goes into so much depth on the whole iodine story, how, you know, for example, we fortified with iodine. We started that in 1924. In the years afterward, thyroid disease amongst women ages 30 to 40 to 50 went up 26 times, (laughs) not percent, times in the United States. So before we fortified with iodine, we pretty much didn't have thyroid disease. And it's not a coincidence that we call it Hashimoto's disease because Japan has more of it than anyone does. So yeah, it's like all about iodine. It's a fascinating story. Check the book out. Wow, I will. Thank you so much. Very You're enlightening. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Good evening, you guys. Uh, this has been really fun to hang out and connect. We're back talking about iron next week. And I do want to figure out some way to do events like this after these are over because these have been really cool. So stay tuned. Uh, Throw me ideas you get to about that and we'll figure something out. But in the meantime, have a great night and we'll see you all sometime soon. Bye-bye.